This is episode 96 of the EdTech Taker from Grantwood AEA. My name is Jonathan Wiley, and I'm joined by two guest hosts today. Let's start with Mindy Carney first. Oh, hello. And also with us today is Jesse Lubinsky. Hi, Jesse. Super excited to be here. All right. So Jesse's going to be uh, talking to us a little bit later about esports, which is we know nothing about. Yeah, it was something <laughs> Indy and I are looking for an education on, but we thought, who better than to get the guy who co-authored the book on it? So, <laughs> esports are coming up, but uh, we're going to start with some news and follow-up. All right. And first thing I think I got on here that I think we're both pretty excited about is yep. this uh, new features coming to Screencastify. Did you see those, Mindy? I did. I didn't get a chance to look at them too carefully, except that I saw there were video quizzes quiz questions is that right yeah um i don't know if they're officially out yet or not but there is a blog post from eric kurtz that oh, yeah. he did um and he got a preview of these so you are able to ask questions multiple choice questions during your videos yeah. just a bit like ed puzzle and yeah. things like that where it'll play and then stop to that point and it also gives you uh, viewer analytics to tell you, you know, how many of your kids have watched your video and things like that, too. So seems like a natural fit for Screencastify. Yeah. So I know that there are some paid features now in Screencastify. Is this one of those? These are free. They're all free. So does this replace Edpuzzle? I don't know. I, don't but know I mean, I say they're free. You're probably still limited to a certain number of Always. minutes in your video, sure. I think. Uh, but If this follows the tracking of pretty much everything else, it's yeah. free for a, for a for time. Now. And then yeah. once we're into it, then it's going to become pay. But, yeah. you know, for those of us who had that nice uh, Screencastify Ed, Pu Ed Puzzle workflow worked out, now we have to, like, rethink everything because we had everything oh, yeah. all figured out it's always the case <laughs> i mean if they can make it a one-stop shop then yeah. then why not but uh yeah well let's see let's see how long it stays free for and uh and how that works out but it's supposed to come out mid-september so yeah. maybe any day now any maybe day now, now by the time maybe you're today. listening to this maybe <laughs> maybe today is a big day uh something else i had on my list for a while that i don't know if i even told you about this or not mindy yeah. but Maybe we mentioned it in the previous episode. I couldn't remember, but I wanted to just call it this uh, Common Lit 360 curriculum. All right. This one is 100% free uh, from what I can see. Yeah. Common Lit is a, a website where you can do um, kind of comprehension type practice where students have got lots and lots of free text. Uh, the curriculum is for grades 6 through 10. They have six units per grade. And they've got texts on there. They've got cross-curricular connections. They've got writing prompts. They've got all the kinds of things you might need. And I'm not going to say you're going to maybe adopt this exactly as is. Mm -hmm. But if you are looking for new ideas, new materials, new texts and things that you can use in your language art curriculum in secondary school, then this could be something to take a look at. Good one. And so common, is this an addition to the old common lit? Is this like yes. an upgrade? I gotcha. Okay. This is a, a new feature um, that they're adding. So Got it. there's two of these kind of programs I usually recommend to ELA teachers, one common lit and the others uh, read works. Oh, yeah. So they're, they're kind of similar yeah. type of uh, programs on there, but both are free and they both offer some pretty high quality stuff. In a world full of paid things, free is always good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, also new on the docket, I guess, we have new Apple devices. Did you see all these, Mindy? We've got no, new... I'm glad that you care. Cause... <laughs> really? You didn't see any of these? No. Okay. There's a new base iPad. There's okay. a new iPad mini. Yeah. There's a new iPhone. I think it's up to 13 now. Oh. And there's a new Apple Watch. Do you have any desire to buy any new Apple products? No. Nothing? You're shopping I'm for not, nothing? I'm not shopping for anything right now. Okay. No. Mm -mm. What about you, Jesse? Wait, are are you a green person, or is that why? She's are not you, a green are person. You a, a I Samsung? am not. Oh, you, She's okay, not you're a green not, bubble. I'm sorry, I no. don't mean to accuse anyone of being yeah, a green person no. if they're not. How rude. Don't come this in was, here and start accusing me of things. <laughs> I came on your podcast and immediately called you a green person. Um, <laughs> this was incredibly disappointing, oh. I have to say. like Usually the Apple events have like something like big, right? We're always waiting for that, you know, that, that yeah. oh, one more yeah. thing, right, that at the end. And... <laughs> And I, I, I just wanted an excuse to upgrade my phone. I just yeah. wanted an excuse to have to go out and get a new phone. And I don't think I got it this year. I, I feel like nothing was substantially 
I mean, portrait mode for a video, that's cool, I guess, but n- n- not enough to make me make the move. This felt yeah. like an S update, not a, not, a, not a full number update for the phones, mm-hmm. at least. Mm-hmm. So nothing groundbreaking this year, which makes me feel like wait one more year until there is something groundbreaking and for sure. change then. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I got a 12 Mini last year and a Series 6 watch last year, mm-hmm. so I'm... I feel like I'm pretty good. There's nothing here that's making me think I need to do anything. I don't know. My wife's on an 11. My mother-in-law is on an iPhone 8 Plus. So I don't know. Anything for those kind of people is going to be an update. But yeah, sure. I don't know. And I don't even think the new iPad for school looks that amazing or awesome. I mean, it's got a slightly newer, faster processor. Will anybody notice the difference? I don't, I don't think so. iPads aren't slow for the most part. So there you go. All right. Well, that was disappointing. Uh, Let's switch from Apple to Google News then. Uh, This one is kind of hot off the press. I saw this one in my inbox this morning. You can now design your own custom themes in new Google Sites. No kidding. Yeah. That's kind of a big deal. It is a big deal. Yeah. Instead of choosing the the four that we've had an option for, the six for the past like five years it's like exactly. wow let's right. do something else that's kind of cool thanks yeah. google so there's a there's a nice uh, blog post on there that goes through and it, it shows you you can create your own from scratch you can choose your own logo your own banner image you can uh choose your own color scheme and your fonts mm-hmm. and it takes me back a little bit to when i was teaching in the classroom the, in the old google sites oh, my school boy. made us uh, my school requested that all the teachers <laughs> have a teacher website yeah. And so they created this template of one that we all duly copied and we yeah. all had teacher websites that were the same color, the same mm-hmm. theme, the same mm-hmm. logos and stuff. And, you know, it's kind of similar to that now. You could look for some continuity or you yep. could build one that was, you know, representative of your own school colors and, and stuff like right. that. So I think that's, I think that's a, good, a good update from Google. Um, other Google update, and I don't think this is uh, particularly um, earth shattering. <laughs> oh, this one, I don't there, know there's why. a new logo coming to Google Tasks. What do you think of that one, guys? I could not care. How many people listening could actually tell you what the what the <laughs> Tasks logo is? Like, I clicked on it, and I'm like, <laughs> I know it. Oh, that's cool. I can't think of what the actual logo is to begin with, and they yeah. show it, and I'm like, oh, okay. I, Who I actually out there is I, using tasks? That's what I want to know. I feel like it's one of those logos that, you know, the, the marketing team at Google were tasked to do. And they all <laughs> shut themselves in a room. And at 8 o'clock, somebody said, you know what? How about we just do a circle and put a check yeah. mark in it? Is everybody good with that? And they're yeah. like, yeah. And Let's for the get, rest of the let's day. Let's go get lunch. Yeah, they went for lunch. Yeah. So they sat around so talking smart. about Netflix. So smart. The boss came in at the end of the day. And so well, what did you guys come up with? And it was like... Oh, oh. Th- this is this why is you guys are the guys. <laughs> I don't know. Tasks but. are one of those things that they are incredibly, when you see it, you're like, this is incredibly useful, right? The yeah. email, I can just from an email, add a task. It's linked right to the email, super useful. And yet I just cannot build it into mm-hmm. my workflow. I've tried repeatedly to do it. I have to figure out a way it... You know, maybe this new logo, I'm just kidding, this new logo is not going to make a difference, but <laughs> it's this new, new, new logo. I do like it better. It's better. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm looking over at my sidebar now, and I've got like Google Calendar and Keep and Task, and it, the 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 logo now just doesn't even look like Task. It's like some kind of pencil with a dot next to right. it or something, and it's so I guess it's it's better than what we have. But um, uh, last thing on the list here, I didn't put it on, so I someone did. else has to talk about it. What it's is me. on here? So now in Google Forms, you know where the gear icon used to be. Now Settings is a new tab. Oh, yeah, that's right. They've got three tabs along yeah. the top now in a Google yeah. form. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think that makes more sense. It does, actually, because I feel like in forms, I'm always clicking to find what I need. And now that settings is in that other tab, I don't have to decide, is it the puzzle piece that I tap on? <laughs> is it the gear I tap? You know, so now yeah. at least it's right there. Not earth shattering, but a little bit more user friendly. I'm yeah. in there now. I like yeah. that. Yeah. I think it's more discoverable. You're more yeah. likely to find those features and settings yeah. like you know making a form a quiz and stuff like that people yeah. don't know where that is sometimes yeah. so now it's right there at your fingertips genius mindy right. yeah. yeah i do what thanks I can. for adding that one <laughs> the one sure you're welcome <laughs> sorry <laughs> all right up next serve to you piping hot our main course which always seems weird when i say it's a person's name it's jesse lubinsky for esports We're so happy to have you here so you can enlighten us on, well, I mean, you could tell us anything about esports and we'd be like, really? Oh, 
Okay, we didn't know that. You could make up everything from here on out. We'd have no idea. It all started with a plumber named Mario. Um, no. <laughs> oh, I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Why don't we start by having Jesse maybe tell us a little bit more about himself, who he is, and, and what he does. Sure. So my name is Jesse Lubinsky. I am currently the chief learning officer for Ready Learner One. Uh, and uh, I've been in education for around 20 years. So I spent first half of my career as a classroom teacher at the middle school and high school level doing math and technology. Then crossed over to the dark side. I was an administrator for a little bit over a decade. I was director of technology and innovation. And then a few years ago, formed a, uh, this company, Ready Learner One, with a few of my colleagues. And uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of work since around emerging technologies. So uh, we actually published two books during the pandemic. The first was Reality Bytes, Innovative Learning Using Augmented Virtual Reality. And the second was the eSports Education Experience, Empowering Every Learner Through Inclusive Gaming. So you can see, you know, between the eSports theme and AR, VR, we've been trying to kind of um, help improve adoption timelines for K-12 schools in terms of, you know, how these technologies kind of take hold in terms of empowering students and improving teaching and learning outcomes. I think you guys know anytime there's something kind of new, it could take like up to a decade before it really hits, you know, mainstream in a school. And I think we don't want to see kids losing out on those learning benefits because we're just too busy ingrained in the work of being educators in school. So how can we kind of make it more applicable to educators and, and, and give them the tools and resources they need in order to be able to, bring this stuff to fruition in their buildings. Nice. So before the show, as, as Mindy has, has hinted, our knowledge of esports <laughs> is pretty limited. I, I thought I'd just make her feel a little bit better. And we watched this uh, SNL video with uh, Chance the Rapper, who is an esports reporter <laughs> during an esports game. Only he's not normally an, uh, an esports reporter. He's normally like a basketball reporter or something. And he, he got drafted in to do this League of Legends uh, show. And he knows... As little about esports as we do, so I don't know. Can you can you give us a one hundred one on esports and and tell us uh, what's going on here and and why we should care about it? Maybe <laughs> so right. So, but I think you know the reaction of Chance the Rapper in that sketch, which by the way, if you haven't seen it, hysterical, and I think probably reflects what ninety nine percent of people would think if they watched an esports event on TV and were listening to commentary and they were just like, "What is happening here?" Um, Esports, very simply defined, is competitive video gaming. And so I know a lot of people instantly, educators, are like, okay, well, what place does that have in a school, uh, competitive video gaming? And as you start to break it down, and as we did in the book, um, you start to see, actually, it's probably one of the most powerful things you could bring into a school uh, to help especially meet the needs of those students who haven't quite connected to the school community or found their connection. I think you know most kids, most adults play games in one form or another at some point during the day, whether it's on your phone, whether it's at home on a console. And so we often talk about school as a place where we want to have students make connections to the things that they love and that they're passionate about. And almost everyone has a connection to games. So we're not suggesting that we just toss the curriculum aside and have students in class sitting there playing video games. When you start to actually unpack what an esports program is and what's involved in creating one, I think that's where you start to see where the really powerful connections can be made. Are you a gamer yourself? How, I mean, how did you get interested? I mean, so I've been a gamer my whole life, but I am definitely not, um, you know, I, I don't spend hours and hours playing on a console or doing deep dives. Like I play games with my son, um, you know, on the Switch and PlayStation, but I'm not like an active esports gamer. So I would say in terms of the co-authors of the book, I probably was third out of the four of us in terms of the amount of time we spent uh, playing games. So Games have always been something that I'm passionate about, game-based learning, which is not necessarily connected with esports, but um, anything that you can kind of add to your toolbox to help empower students has always been of interest to me. So I think the more, we always knew we wanted to write a book on esports, Christine uh, Lyme Bailey, who's the, one of our co-founders at Ready Learner One, we were going to write a book on esports and we knew Chris Avilas and Steve Isaacs, who both founded Garden State Esports, and we've known them for years they were actually working on something as well. And we kind of basically talk, talked about joining forces, I guess, for the purposes of writing the book, because they had the practical experience. They were the first middle school educators to actually get programs up and running uh, hmm. in the country. And 
they had the expertise of actually doing the work in schools, whereas Christine and I had had that experience of being administrators in a school district, understanding the kind of um, nuances of getting a program up and running, what are some of the challenges that you're going to face, particularly with esports. And so we came to it from that perspective, and I think we're able to bring together not a lot of viewpoints that uh, are reflected in the book. So not being a gamer myself, and you know, my kids aren't really gamers, I don't think either, but so what are, what are kids playing? Like what kind, are we playing Madden? Are we this League of Legends? What, what's happening? What are we playing? It's funny. Game selection is actually like one of the most um, important things in terms of selecting a program. Cause I think that kind of, that kind of makes it approachable for everyone or right. You want to make sure your program is inclusive because otherwise you wind up with a very, a very small subset of students who are just interested in something. So you mentioned league of legends. That's one of the most popular uh, games out there. As far as esports go rocket league, which is kind of like mm. soccer with cars um, even games on the switch, super smash brothers. One thing that, and we've started talking about this a lot when we've been talking about esports during these sessions, chess became incredibly popular uh, during the pandemic, I think in part because of the Queen's Gambit. But right, uh-huh. we often talk about the fact that there are chess clubs in school. If you're literally competing with schools through a website, that's an esport, right? So in a, in a way, I think we've come to start talking about chess as like that entry level esport that a lot of people are playing because they're playing online chess. That's an esport. That's competitive gaming. So it it can it can look different in in different schools, right? Where some people have teams, some people have clubs, some people, I mean, we're actually working with a school district right now on developing an esports elective class for their high school students because, and this is the, the big takeaway, I think, uh, here, if, if we're going to say, like, here's the big takeaway about esports, it's not about games. It's, it's actually about giving students 21st century skills. So when you look at an esports club or an esports team, it's made up of many people. It's not, they, they aren't just gamers. They're people who are interested in broadcasting, streaming, writing, um, managing, right? There's all different roles that people play on a team. And a lot of these roles line up with the, we talk about the jobs of the future. How are we going to prepare students for the jobs of tomorrow that don't exist yet? Well, guess what? These are the skill sets of what the foundations of those jobs are going to look like, right? Everyone these days knows how to, needs to know how to stream or broadcast or do something, particularly after the pandemic right? There's always going to be um, a use for writing, uh, for organizational skills. All of those different things are components of a team to the point where when you look at how universities are giving out esports scholarships, some of them are actually giving out scholarships, not to gamers, but to writers, to broadcasters, to people who have that content. So we're actually working on developing a course that's going to end in a capstone where a streamer, for instance, can actually develop like a fully fleshed out stream that they've managed. And that becomes their artifact of learning Hmm. that can be put forward um, as their project, essentially. Yeah. And I put this on the show notes and I think you saw it, but um, I I saw this tweet from Mike Washburn and he said, when my son is playing Fortnite with his friends online and I'm listening to them, I can hear that they're collaborating, communicating, problem solving, iterating, setting goals, making plans and, those are all the good, you know, like those 21st century skills or soft skills or whatever you want to call them, the four C's, those things that we talk about a lot today and that we're trying to get kids involved in. So it makes sense that, you know, we should be doing more more activities that are promoting those things. Um, and they might be things that are slightly outside the box, like esports, but, you know, it could be very mainstream in, in a few years for sure. Shout out to Mike Washburn, by the way. He actually wrote um, a chapter in our book. He wrote the history of esports uh, chapter in our book. He's like our resident historian. And he's absolutely right. If you were to take a look at what an esports esports practice looks like, it's actually a lot of the same things you would see with an, a, a formal you know, varsity athletics team where they're working on, spe- they're not just sitting there and playing games for two hours. They're working on specific skills. They're working on team communication strategies because in game, they have to be communicating with each other to make sure they're all on the same page in terms of what they're doing. It's not um, single event oriented, right? It's team oriented, the goals of the esports team. So it's very much in, in alignment with a lot of the things we look at. And in fact, the way our book is broken up, we don't even start talking about how to form an esports program until the fourth out of four parts of the book. 
The first part is actually focused on the SEL benefits of an esports program. So we talk a lot in schools about SEL, but we don't necessarily have uh, practical or pragmatic pathways for getting to some of those goals. And an esports program hits many of them and actually gives us an entry point to start having those conversations around, you know, how do we communicate online? How do we do some of those digital citizenship pieces that we always talk about? How do we provide students with a safe place of belonging and making them feel like school is something they're connected to? You know, my role in the book was I was the person who went out and did all the interviews and then kind of pulled all those stories into the book. And one of my favorite stories was actually from a school in California where they had a student who was in their alternative ed school. They had actually started a esports program in their alternative ed school where it was like bring your own device. They were bringing their own Nintendo Switches in and doing Super Smash Brothers. And participation in that program became tied to attendance. So these students who were never coming to school were now coming to school all the time and not only attending you know, their esports program, but were going to their other classes and doing their school work. And right before the first competition, the parents of one of these um, team members had called the school and said, hey, is it okay if we come to the competition? They're like, yeah, that'd be great. And then they call back a few minutes later and like, well, we have relatives that want to fly up from Sacramento. Can they come as well? And that's when it hit him, uh, the director, that, you know, these were families who have never been connected to the school mm-hmm. community before. They never had a place in that community. Now, through this esports program, they've not only been able to become connected to com- the community and feel that that sense of belonging, but they're now achieving success in school that they didn't previously see. Just by ha- just by feeling validated in the fact that the fact that I love games and I love to game is something that we approve of in school that we not only endorse, but we're putting it out there for something for you to do that's connected to the school community. Because like I said, school should be a place where kids are able to pursue their passions. We say that all the time, but yet we don't back it up because we poo-poo things that we don't feel like will help meet the end goal of improving scores on a standardized test, so to speak. Okay, so I feel like... <laughs> I, I I connect with all of that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. I need to know, like, what does a competition look like? Like, <laughs> how, I mean, you want to get into brass tacks. I really here, need right? you to tell me. Like, I can't envision what it looks like. So they just start from the beginning. If I were to walk so in, I will, yeah, I will tell you right now. Okay. You should look up. Um, you should look up, and you could look up Garden State Esports. That's where Chris and Steve have done a lot of great work. But okay. look up some high school or middle school esports yeah. competitions. I think you'll be pretty amazed because the thing to keep in mind while you're watching this, it looks like a highly produced, like it's something you'd see on TV. Okay. Oftentimes, kids are producing it. Kids are doing awesome. the broadcasting. Kids are doing the play-by-play. They're running commentary. They're talking about what, what they're seeing on the screen and breaking hmm. down strategy. What you're going to see are, yes, kids are sitting – in chairs or on streams and actually, you know, playing games, but they're communicating with each other. They're talking, um, you know, you could see there's clear strategy in play. There's a coach kind of monitoring and, you know, uh, depending on whether it's a stream or whether it's, um, you know, in person kind of facilitating the whole thing. It's, it's really impressive when you see it happen. And schools, a lot of, some schools in, in, um, in certain areas and in certain states are actually building esports arenas where these competitions take place. Like this is not Shut an uncommon door. thing. <laughs> yeah. Fill in arenas. I, so, yeah. uh, and I'm going to give a shout out to Chris of ELS, my co-author. He actually moved school districts this year to go to a school where they basically were bringing him in to, to help build huh. their esports facility. Uh, the state of New Jersey is actually building a, um, a large scale facility where they're playing esports. How competitions. large are we talking here? I was, so I was just out in Dallas and I went to a Texas Rangers game. And if you, if you, if you're familiar with Dallas, you know, that the Cowboy stadium is right there. Uh, The new Rangers ballpark, the old Rangers ballpark. And then right next to there is an esports like facility, Um, which is, it's almost like a small convention center size thing. These are full arenas. I mean, and they're used not just for school competitions, but people will actually, I mean, they're used for other types of esports competitions as well, but Hmm. It's becoming a real thing. And I don't, I, what's shocking to me, and we talked about this a little bit before we went on, went on the air, is I don't think people realize how big these competitions have no, gotten. The right. League of Legends Championship actually had more viewers than the Super Bowl. I don't, I, no, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, really? it sounds crazy, but if you, right, if you, if you look at it, if you look at the numbers, yeah. they bear it out. And even I was surprised as I was doing research for the book. You know, one thing that is cool. So, one of the, my favorite interview from the process of writing the book was with Amon Green, who 
He was a four-time Pro Bowl running back with the Green Bay Packers. Um, played for 10 seasons. Awesome guy. He actually retired from the NFL and then coached high school football for a decade. And all that, that whole time, he was really into playing esports and he had a, a stream you know, uh, that he would actually run, bring people on, talk about esports. He's actually now the head esports coach at Lakeland University in Wisconsin mm-hmm. and runs their esports program. And we had a really good conversation about, he says, you know, my esports athletes work just as hard as the athletes that I played football with. It looks different and people don't sure. understand it, but the time they spend on their craft. And I think the conception you probably have of an esports player is it's some kid sitting in a chair in the dark with a controller with potato chip crumbs on him. And <laughs> what's funny is, and we talk about this in the book, esports athletes have to actually have an extremely strict wellness program in order to be successful. Like that means stretching, yoga, dieting, because again, they rec- you recognize they are going to be static in playing games. So they have to ensure that they're keeping their bodies and maintaining a healthy, um, you know, that they're athletes, right. They have to maintain mm-hmm. a healthy body in order to compete. And it sounds crazy a little bit, but that's, what's happening in all these yeah. schools and all these programs is they're using this as an opportunity to bring in SEL, to bring in yeah. wellness. These are all things we talk about in the book. The second part of the book, we actually focus on what are some of those key issues that we know when people hear competitive video gaming that they're going to hone in on, mm-hmm. such as violence in video games, toxic right. gaming culture, too much screen time, mm-hmm. all those different things. And what we did was we said, let's put it out there right away. Here's Here are the concerns you're going to hear about. And here's what the research shows. We went out and did all the research, took a look at studies that were done, you know, um, academic studies that were done and basically say here, we're not saying this is right or wrong. We're just saying, here's the actual research that supports these answers that we don't see aggressive behaviors as a result of playing uh, some of these games. And in fact, if you're choosing the right game that mitigates that risk anyway, you know, how you mitigate those screen time risks, what to do about toxic gaming culture, how to empower your students to have ownership over helping build those programs so that you uh, alleviate some of those issues ahead of time. Like we wanted to be very clear, like we're not saying, yay, esports, you you should just do it and don't care about building it in an intelligent way. You have to build it in an intelligent mm-hmm. way. You have to make sure you have stakeholders in the community that are that are on board before you roll this program out. You, you know, I see in the show notes we we're about to talk about parents. <laughs> if you don't get your parents on board before you do this, right. you're gonna fail. Like yeah. you have to sell them before you even sell your community member. Because once you sell them on the benefits of it and they're on your side, no one, you know, no one stops the parent tidal wave once it's once it's in your favor, right? So that's a strategic move to make sure you get your parents on board first, to make sure you're talking to all the stakeholders in your school district from custodial staff to your tech staff, to your clerical and classified people who kind of know the inner workings of how the budget works. Make sure you have all these people as partners in the process and not afterthoughts because you're so excited to get this program up and running. You have to do it in a really thoughtful, mindful way. Yeah, and obviously the kids are the are the easy ones to persuade and get on board for this. They're the ones that are going to be lining up at the door to it. But like you said, you know, you need to have parents on board. They're going to be thinking, "Well, my kids play video games at home all day as it is. They're already not going outside. They're already getting a lot of screen time. Why, you know, why should they have more of this?" So, you know, are are there good answers to things like that, or or not? If esports becomes an incentive for kids to participate or do the work in their own classes, like in other words, like any other team, they can only do that if they are maintaining their grades and doing all the stuff in their other courses. Of course. In fact, I would argue that right now parents struggle to keep kids off of games at the expense of their grades in their classes. So why wouldn't we want to say, okay, well, we're going to let you be part of this esports program, but you have to be maintaining your grades and you have to be doing all of this other stuff in order to, to, to be part of the team. And, when I say part of the team in a lot of schools and Chris in particular and Steve have both been strong advocates of this. I mean, they get jerseys. They walk when, when, when there's pep rallies, like the esports team is there. There's a change in terms of how those students, these students are not your typical athletes, right? These are students who probably for many reasons couldn't compete in sports, whether they weren't athletically gifted. We're, we're now providing that opportunity to students who may not have had a chance to, to be part of the varsity, you know, sports experience in a high school. And now they get to live that out doing something they love. It brings them closer to the school. It makes them more incentivized to want to do the work uh, in their classes. 
it, it just it, it it almost makes too much sense in many ways. <laughs> I think as parents, we I, I try and remind myself of this. I have to try and remind myself of this, but we need to be open to different opportunities for our kids than like when when we grew up. You know, being a YouTuber wasn't a career option that we had because YouTube didn't exist and those kind of things weren't out there. We couldn't be social media marketers. We couldn't be, you know, esport gamers. But, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that technology is now enabling that is creating new careers and new opportunities for our kids. And, you know, if we don't let them explore some of these things, then they're never going to know if that's something that is a passion for them and something that they want to follow. You know, one thing I would say, and I'm sure you're probably thinking this yourself, like if I was going to start a program, like I don't know anything about esports. Like yeah. how could I even be a value in doing this in my school? And I think you both hit on a point a few minutes ago, which is don't worry about it. Your kids know everything there is to know about the games themselves. You don't need that. They don't need you for that. They need the adult supervisor to help be that mentor and that person who can navigate through, through the process of running a club or a team You'll figure it out along the way, but they know the games. That's not what they need you for. They need you to help model some of those SEL practices, um, you know, to ensure good sportsmanship, things like that. Things that any coach knows how to do, no matter what sport they're teaching. But unlike other sports where like, if I'm going to be the baseball coach, I really have to have this, you know, thorough knowledge of baseball. You don't need that for esports because the games change, the kids change, but the kids know the games right? You're more of a facilitator than an actual um, content area expert. And I feel like this is something we talked about, a shift we talked about in teaching for years, right? The shift of us from being content area experts to being facilitators of learning. Esports is very much about that. So if I am like listening right now and I'm like, yes, this is it. You know, yes. I, I really want to see this happen at my school. You know, I've got students who are asking me about it. Is there a checklist of things to get started? Is there a certain amount of funds that I need to have? You know, how do you actually start and get this thing off the ground? So it's scalable, right? So anything. And by the way, if you're looking for a starting place, the esports education playbook, empowering every learner through inclusive gaming, available oh, on Amazon.com. Wow. Oh, oh, okay. For you, we'll walk you through the process <laughs> of creating an esports program and list all of those benefits and help you with those challenges of who do I get on board? Sure. You know, what are those big questions? What is the research? But beside that, to answer your question, <laughs> <laughs> shameless plug. To answer <laughs> your question, what, yeah. um, many schools we've seen do it with like a bring your own device mm -hmm. initiative to begin with as as kind of a pilot, right? So. Sure. You know, we, we form a club, we have an advisor, we're just bringing our own stuff in and kind of feeling it out. Then once we're comfortable, we can start to look at competitions that are available, other games. Uh, one place I would definitely look as a starting point is NISEF, which is the North American Scholastic Esports Federation. They have a ton of different opportunities available for people to connect uh, within esports, and they also... Um, I would say that's a, that's a really good place to start. They have okay. a ton of curricula, curriculum available to be able to embed some of this stuff into the classroom. But again, that may be too big of a first step, baby steps. Start by gathering interest. Start by making sure that that interest is inclusive, right? So we don't want just like a group of boys uh, playing esports. We want to make sure that girls feel like it is a place for them as well, that the students have the ability to help make the choices about what games they're going to be playing. Um, and I think if you build it with them collaboratively and you make sure all people, you know, all of your stakeholders feel like they have an active part of this, that it's going to be successful. Yeah. And I think the point of that, you know, I mean, really what's at the center of what you're saying is that kids need, want to feel included and connected to their school and part of something. So even if they're not competing against another school, if they're together and working on some of those skills that are really important for the future, then we've achieved what we're looking for, right? Even if you had students, so I know a lot of a lot of middle schools and high schools now have, you know, news programs and things like that. If you have an esports club producing a stream that becomes part of like the news segment and so like sure. again, that's skill development. You have students developing content. They're content creators. That's that is something I think all teachers are like, oh yes, we want our students to be content creators. Well great. You just we're able to get them to create content for the school that had nothing to do with a class or a grade. Sure. So that's a win. Yes. But I guess my question is always that guiding question for me with esports has always been 
how do we get our students to feel connected to the school community, especially those students who have never been able to find their place, right? Mm -hmm. This is just another outlet. And because of the number of kids that play games, it makes it a more natural landing spot for them because that's something I think that resonates with everyone. Well, this certainly has been very enlightening. And I, you know, I'm going to be completely honest, like coming into this, you know, Jonathan wanted to talk about esports and I was like, yeah, sure, whatever, you know, but <laughs> I, you've really helped me see how it connects all of the dots. And so I, I don't know, I'm really interested now. And I think it's good to know that, that you yourself don't have to be the expert right, in the room, because yeah. I think as a teacher... You know, we, we talk to teachers about trying to be more vulnerable and things mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, they want to know, you know, they've got that backup, that comfort of the content knowledge and stuff sure. that they can have. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I listen to my son playing Fortnite and even like some of the vocabulary yeah. is just like. It's, he just made that I, word it's, up. It's brand new stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's talking mm -hmm. about people being toxic or being cracked or sweats and stuff and I'm like what is all this stuff but you know that if you're involved involved in that and you work with the kids and you build it collaboratively like Jesse said then you know you're you're going to learn learn along the way I'll just last thing I'll share is Christine's in her own district when they were getting an esports program up and running they needed an advisor and the basketball coach gave up coaching basketball to switch over to esports oh he knew nothing about it and he was just like the kids seem so excited about this. I just want to kind of know what this is all about and help them get this up and running. So I think if you if 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 someone like that could take the leap from teaching a sport that they are very comfortable with and coaching that to now coaching something they have no familiarity with just because they know that the kids are super passionate about it, I think any of us could, you know, try to do that same thing for our kids. All right. So up next, my favorite part of the show is tech nuggets. Tech Nuggets. Yeah. I know you've got a good one to start. I do have a good one to start, yeah. I think. I'm going to just drop this one. And then this is uh, coming in iOS 15, which I think is released on September 20th. Okay. You know, we talked about this at the start of the show where there's no big updates or <laughs> <laughs> new Everything things sucks. happening. Yeah. Everything's iterative. <laughs> but one of the interesting things they have coming is called Live Text. And so what this lets you do is um, in the camera of an iPhone or an iPad, you will be able to take a picture of something like a piece of paper or something on the wall. And the iOS device will recognize if there's text in the image. So a couple of things you can do with that. You know, one, you know, you can copy and paste the text out of that image into another app. I think what's also interesting is that if you have things like speak selection turned on, you can take a picture of like a paper worksheet or something, and then it will recognize the text and you can have that text read aloud. So I think from a, like an accessibility standpoint, yeah. or we're looking at ways to make content more accessible to more kids, more of the time, I think live text has got a lot of potential to be really powerful. So um, coming soon to an iOS device near you on September 20th. It's a good one. It I could like be life-changing for people. I think it could be, yeah. yeah. I mean, because we, you know, sometimes all, not all the content we give to kids is accessible or we don't have digital versions of all our textbooks and yeah. things that we can do. And sure, we can sometimes scan things and make PDFs. Yeah. And, but, you know, if you can just pick up an iPad and scan it and it's done, you've got read aloud text right there. Well, and I think the cool thing about it is that it puts the power in the user's hands as opposed to like having someone else do it for you. You know, mm, like yeah. it's it's more empowering to be able to take care of some of those things yourself and in the moment per have more accessibility to things. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, so I heard about this thing. And this is what I love about Tech Nuggets is that I can kind of know like a little bit about something and just throw it out there and be like, and I'm done. So you could be an esports coach. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> You're perfectly I feel qualified. I like my whole there life as an esports coach, to yeah. be honest. Um, it's called Packback. And I heard about this from one of our administrators that they were just kind of checking out right now. But the way they're using it is that it is AI feedback on writing. Okay. Yeah, and that's it. That's all I got for you. Right. So um, it's a paid service, but it allow it provides feedback for students, but all through AI. Hmm. I know. 
Well, if you think about it, you know, things like, you know, Grammarly yeah. kind of does that, kind doesn't it? Kind of does it? that, yeah. You know, yeah. Google Docs kind of does kind that Kind of now. does that. So... Yeah. Just takes that a little, a little bit, bit further. further. Yeah. So um, I have not looked into it a ton because I just heard it in my last meeting of the day yesterday. And I'm like, this is, I mean, it's very rarely I've never heard of something. And I was like, I'm sorry, did you say backpack or pack back? So I just thought, hey, I'll throw this out there. And, um, you know, people want to take a look at it. He did tell me he thought it was kind of expensive. Um, but what isn't these days? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually underlined in the Google Doc by Grammarly, and it's saying, did you mean backpack? Yeah. And I'm like, so, yeah. no, but it's called pack back. Pack back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting one. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, lowest common denominator here because what teacher does not need a random name generator? Everybody does. Everybody needs one of those, right? <laughs> yeah. So I have to see uh, Tony Vincent tweet this one out. Yeah. And... Okay, it's a random name generator, and you've probably seen tons of these. I thought this one was kind of interesting because if you go up to the customize button in okay. there, you've got different options here. So that are just kind of fun, I think, for random yeah. name genera- generators. So mm-hmm. different sounds that it can make after it has chosen the person on the the wheel of fortune that you've uh, got to spin here. So mm-hmm. you can have, you know, Christmas music, you can have cheering, you can have drum and bass, you can have different things like that. Um, you can choose to allow duplicates. You can have it spin slowly for extra drama, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, you can adjust the spin time. So it can adjust for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 yep. seconds. You know, you can do it that way. Change the number of uh, names visible on the wheel. Um, animate the winning entry. Launch confetti. Oh, my. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can change the color of the wheel, the size of the, the, the thing at the center of the wheel. So I don't know. If you just want to do uh, random name pickers on steroids, then wheelofnames.com <laughs> is where you need to go, I think. Can I put a disclaimer on something like this? Sure. Now, remember that kids sometimes don't like to be put on the spot. So oh, what yeah. you could use this ahead of time is to spin three names, be like, these are the three kids that will be responsible for the answer or for sharing after you've had some group discussion. So just kind of keep that in mind. No one likes to be put on the spot. I mean, some people I'm sure do. Most mm-hmm. people probably don't. So use it for good, not for evil. Are our guests allowed to throw out a, t- a tech nugget yeah, as well? Of course you are. I would love to hear a tech Okay, nugget. thank you. So I... <laughs> So this is another shameless plug here. So this is actually one that we shared on our podcast. So I co-host the podcast Partial Credit with uh, Donnie Piercy and Jeffrey Heil. And it, we have a segment called Something Useless that Donnie Piercy found online. This was actually oh, from episode like two, I think. And it actually got taken down. So it wasn't working. But as we were talking, I was like, you know, we're talking esports. Wouldn't it be cool if this was working? And it was. Oh. So I'm like, okay, it's back. So whether you know nothing about esports, chances are you have seen Sesame Street before. Yes. <laughs> chances are you also may know the video game Street Fighter. Yep. So what we have here is Sesame Street Fighter. Oh my. So it is a learning game version of Street Fighter using Sesame Street characters in place of the um oh that's playing it as loud. I, I just did exactly the same thing in my headphones. Yeah, I'm like, so wow, if you that's go loud. to the website that is linked in the show notes. <laughs> You can see we have uh, a bunch of different uh, Sesame Street characters. You can select them, and then you win by, um, you know, spelling things out and stuff like that. So Fun. very cool at the elementary level. Yeah. A little, a little esports uh, nugget slash Sesame Street. It might have to be a new addition to the podcast, like eSport Nugget. <laughs> you have to <laughs> keep looking. <laughs> and it's all like an original, I don't know what, an 8 or 16-bit graphics yeah. or something. It's all kind of this blocky animation That's stuff awesome. on there too. So I like that. Anything else on there, Mindy? Um, I have one. I mean, I'm going to you know pull a page right out of Jesse's playbook here and do a shameless plug. So the Blended and Personalized team at Grantwood AEA has a webinar series for uh, are called The Four Tenets of Blended and Personalized Learning. That first episode will be released um, next week to uh, kind of share some of the work that we've been doing with blended and personalized learning and um, tools and things like that that we are sharing with all of our districts right now. So 
you can click on the show notes and sign up for those webinars to be directly deposited into your inbox starting next week. Nice. I know you guys have been working hard on that one, so I'm looking forward to checking that out. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So, Jesse, thank you very much again for joining us on the show today. If people wanted to find out more about you and find that amazing book and follow you (laughs) online and see all the stuff you're doing, where should they go? So um, best place would probably be jessielubinsky.com. So it's J-E-S-S-E-L-U-B-I-N-S-K-Y.com. Um, you can also check out my work at readylearner.one, O-N-E, and changemakeredu.org. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Jay Lubinsky, and you can check out the Partial Credit Podcast at partial.credit. Awesome. Did you get all that? Yeah, I think all so. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll put all that in the show notes. That's how I do this a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was real smooth. I was like, holy smokes. All right. So I think that rounds up everything we have for this week. Let us know what you think about yeah. esports if you want or to if hear you're doing more. It, yeah. Yeah. We, we would love to hear about yeah. what you're doing. I don't know if we have too many schools near us right now that right. are doing it. Or if they are, I guess I just don't know about yeah, it. Tell but us. Yeah. I, would, I would love to see what that looks like in yeah, practice. Yeah, for sure. So until next time. This has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast.